Hello, you're watching Transbrations. I'm Nishan Dion. This month, we're celebrating Women's History Month. Today's special guest is Tunisia Ofray. She's a Renaissance woman and boss lady and is the co-founder at Shepherd's Door Domestic Violence Resource Center, servicing victims and survivors of domestic violence in the Los Angeles County area for more than 17 years. Shepherd's Door mission is to break the cycle of domestic violence through relationship education, financial literacy, youth violence prevention education, support groups, and direct rescue intervention. Shepherd's Door has created a haven for domestic violence survivors and a network to encourage women helping women reach and succeed in their potential and maintain a lifestyle balance. In 2009, Tunisia founded Women Wealth Warriors. The platform was created to support women entrepreneurs and women in business. Tunisia is also the owner of Prestige Insurance and Financial Services and an executive producer and the mother of four. You've always been a bronze beauty. I mean, you were beautiful back then when I met you. Nice personality, sweet girl, very petite and just beautiful smile. Um, uh, we all have them or have them, or we all have them, or at some point have them throughout our life. How have you dealt with your share of, well, actually, well, yeah, this was one of the questions. How have you dealt with your share of haters? And you already talked about it. The girls hating on you at the winter ball. Oh, yes. I had like a mob of haters. And it just has, you know, what's so crazy? And it's continued from there. I always, for a long time, I never understood why women did not like me. Like, like why don't they like me? Like, look at me. You, why you don't like me? I got babies. I ain't got, you know, a single mom. In my mind, the, all the things that I thought were, why you don't want this life? Like, you know, why are you hating on me? And it took me years to understand. Well, once once I understood my value, right? And then I had to be real about how I show up. And, and the very thing that I thought were negatives, why nobody wanted to be me, was the exact reason why I realized a lot of women didn't like me. One, I didn't realize for years that a lot of women have issues with fertility. I did not know that was really a thing because I got easy, I, I get pregnant really easy. I've had so many women, uh, so easy, let me tell you, that's why I got four kids and it probably would have been more, you know, <laughs> I'm just saying. And so, and so I've had women hate me because I have kids. I have women hate me because I have kids and I'm still little. I had women hate me because I was still desirable to men. I had women hate me because I'm a badass single mama who do it by myself and I don't need no man to help me. I mean, not that I, I do like help, but I'm just saying, like I've been able to hold it down and get it done by myself. So there's so many reasons why people hate on you. I had to really figure that out. This took me a long, long time to get to that point. Bitch, <laughs> why are you mad? Cause my pussy pops severely and yours don't. And the thing is, of course, they're never going to come out. You, 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 you'll never know because it's not like they're about to, you know, tell you like, get, you know, give you the list. <laughs> no, they, they just secretly try and do things, sabotage you, and not support you. And I think oh, it yeah. really stood out. Well, homecoming was the first and time and, that and, I was and, and Tunisia, and ain't never gonna clap for you. Oh, never. Never gonna never. clap for you. Watch everything you do. Oh, social media will teach you that. They be the first one. Every time I post up, staring. Oh my gosh, she wore that because, as you know, I don't mind being sexy. I said, I'm going to show all this while I still have it. Because, one, I'm proud that I still got it and it's still all natural. I haven't had to do nothing yet, but I will if I needed to, but I haven't had to yet. Um, and I'm proud of like the fact that I've gone through the things that I've gone through and God has still preserved me in my mind. Like, I'm still preserved. I do not look like what I've been through. That to me says a lot. I've always felt the same way with how with how I look. Um, obviously, I don't look like this every day. You know, I don't wake up looking like this. But just um, how I've been able to preserve myself and still look youthful, and just the self care. You know, knowing that knowing what I had been through and the mental health challenges that I've had, I became aware of mental health. I guess, like to some degree, the term mental health. I guess you know, after that happened to me, I had immediately went into therapy. You know, talking with therapists and stuff. But I didn't start to have, you know, real heavy issues with, um, you know, mental health until like 2001, 2002, 2003. And I remember the, you know, there was the California Victims of Crime. You know, they covered some of my bills after, you know, for therapy back then and everything. Um, I don't know, you know, what that system and stuff is set up like. You know, that's the system I went through for my therapy for myself and my kids. So they're still around victims of crime. Right. Well, yeah, well, yeah I, I know it's still around. I don't know if it's improved or, you know, if they, if they have more services or whatever. But Becoming a victim of violent crime is not a choice. But when it happens, it's important to know that you're not alone. CalVCB can help. We cover medical and dental treatment, mental health services, income loss, funeral and burial costs, and other crime-related expenses. For help, call 1-800-777-9229 or visit victims.ca.gov.
you know, as far as the, the victims, I can say that, you know, after that happened to me and going through that process, I mean, you know, no one's going to, no one walks your, no, no one walks you through anything and holds your hand after you've been through a traumatizing event. Um, you know, whether it's domestic violence, rape, uh, gun violence, whatever, you know, there's no, you know, I mean, you know, you go through the emergency, the health services or whatever that you need at that time, you know, you deal with the courts and those people, whatever, after all that stuff is done, you know, you're, you're back to your, I want to say normal life, but you now have a new life and you have mm -hmm. to navigate, you have to navigate through this world where you now have to deal with these intense feelings sometimes, which are rage, um, anger, um, you know, depending on your mental health issues, it could be, you know, su suicide, it could be homicide. Um, it could be a number of, of emotions and feelings that you now have to deal with that are very uncomfortable um, to the point where, you know, some people end up committing suicide because they don't know how to deal with those feelings. And the feelings are very uncomfortable. Um, yeah. You know, and people call people, you know, oh, you're crazy, you're this or you're that. And people don't understand, you know, people don't I mean, well, no, people don't just, you know, go to bed and wake up. Um, it's a gradual process of things that have happened to people over a period of time in their lives, why they end up behaving you know, sometimes the way they behave. Now, there are many resources out here to help victims of crimes and their families get through these difficult times. Linda Gledhill is the executive officer with the California Victim Compensation Board, and she's joining us live to talk to us about how victims of mass violence events can get the help that they deserve. Linda, thank you so much for joining us here on Fox 40 News at 11. Thank you, Melanie. I appreciate it. Of of course, so when someone becomes the victim of a, a traumatizing event, there are many hardships to overcome, as you can imagine, you know, medical expenses, funeral arrangements, therapy. So is compensation an aspect that is often overlooked by victims because they're having to deal with so many, many other things? It, it can be, yes. I mean, first I wanna say my heart goes out to the victims and their families um, of this incident. Um, and it's our mission to help support victims of violent crime uh, like this. And in the immediate aftermath of a tragedy, you know, costs may not be something that people are thinking about, but we know that these are serious costs, funeral expenses, medical expenses, mental health expenses. So CalVCB is here to help victims of violent crime. And as the pair of last resort, victims in some cases and their families, you know, may be eligible to receive reimbursement of those very costly expenses. And they might not know that, so this is great to talk about because they're probably watching, they're saying, oh my gosh, I had no idea. And the Victim Compensation Board has played a significant role in past mass tragedies here in California. The Gilroy Garlic Festival shooting and the San Jose VTA rail yard attack, just to name a few. So how will these events influence the way you guys are going to take care of the victims of the downtown shooting? Yes, unfortunately, we do have experience in this area. We work very closely with all of our local um, officials, and in this case, with the Sacramento Police and Sacramento County, um, they've been partners with us. Um, and in any incident, we work very closely uh, with the local on the ground partners. Uh, sometimes we also respond to the scene. And we really want to just make sure that everyone knows that we're available to help them with their um, costs, because costs may not show up right away. Um, and they may, once you're eligible and you have an application on file, we can continue to pay those costs up to certain limits that we have. So we really want to make sure people get those applications in. They may not know when they need us, but we want to be there when they do. Yeah, and let's talk about the, the qualifications and the limitations when seeking compensation. What are they? So we have a maximum compensation limit of $70,000. Um, you have seven years up to the uh, after the crime to apply, or if you're under the age of 21, you can apply up until age 28. Um, you obviously must be a victim of violent crime. Um, and we, people who are involved in the commission of a crime are not eligible. And it's important to note we are the pair of last resort, which means that we reimburse bills after other insurance is taken into consideration. Um, you, you, we encourage everyone to fill out an application, though, and we'll work with you to make sure that we um, pursue all, all the things that you're eligible for. And Linda, okay, last thing, how do we apply if we are a victim of mass violence events like the one we just saw on Sunday? 
Yes, or any or any crime. Of course, we're talking about that mass violent event. But if you're a victim of a crime, you may be eligible. So please go to our website, with, which is victims.ca.gov, and fill out an application. You may also have an application mailed to you, and you can by calling our customer service center, which is one eight hundred seven 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 nine two two nine. Perfect. And I actually checked out your website. It's great. It does list the qualifications and the categories a victim would fit in and would be eligible for compensation. So um, Linda Glendhill, the executive officer with the California Victim Compensation Board, joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much for letting us know how we can help our victims even more. We appreciate your time. Thank you for the opportunity. Mel. Yeah, 100%. And you're right. I, I teach a class and um, actually I teach a class to incarcerated women who are um, on probation and a part of their sentencing is to do um, 52 week mandated domestic violence classes. But my, I, so I have created a curriculum that's more geared around um, healing, right? So I'm not gonna come here, preach to you about the bad things you've done, but I've created a safe space for these women to come into my class and let's talk about your heart. Let's talk about your soul. Let's talk about, you know, that part of you that's broken so we can heal her. Because once we heal her, then what you've done that got you here in my class, you won't repeat, you know? And those are the, that's kind of the things that I've, I've figured out through my journey of healing, because you're right. Like after that experience I had at 16, um, I was just left with the pain and to, of holding that and not knowing what to, to do with it. And after a while, it does become so heavy. So you do, you would rather check out than to stay here. And I always tell people like, God gave me a baby because he knew that after that, I was not going to be able to be here for me because the pain was too hard to be here for me, right? Mm -hmm. I needed to have to wake up every day for someone else. Mm -hmm. Now I wake up for me, but for mm -hmm. years I didn't wake up for me. I woke up for them. Mm -hmm. And that's why I look at my kids. I'm like, all four of them are angels because I didn't want to be here anymore. Carrying that pain, it just gets to be so heavy to you rather not wake up. And mm -hmm. I, I never had the courage to want to do something to myself, but I, I definitely remember lots of times when I laid in bed and I'm like, you can just take me and I'm okay with it. Like, cause I needed to feel relief, you know, carrying that level of pain with you every single day. I, I, I said to the women in my class, I said, it's like, it's like packing a, a heavy ass suitcase and you just keep buying more stuff and you keep putting it in a suitcase. And then every day you got to carry this big ass suitcase around every single day and some throughout time throughout the day you get exhausted you like i can't but then you know you got to get back up because you got to get to your next place but you got to keep carrying the suitcase mm -hmm. at some point you're going to exhaust yourself and you're not going to be able to do it anymore and that's what life feels like when you're carrying that much pain right. and we have a lot of people carrying that much pain every single day mm -hmm. and and then we're shocked at the outcomes of the things that we're seeing as it pertains to people, the violence, the, the drugs, the, the violence that they're perpetrating onto themselves. I mean, you have to release. And if you haven't been giving the tools to release that in a healthy way, it will come out very negative. Like for me, after having that experience, I, I, I struggled with self-worth. So I was, I call it my whole phase. You know, because at some point you disconnect. I call it my whole phase I went through. Because I felt like my vagina didn't mean anything. You know, it was already taken at this point. So like... <laughs> I didn't really, I didn't value myself that way for a full long minute, you know, and then I found power in it. Like, oh, I can fuck him and get up and walk away and, and hurt him and, and not mean anything. I, I like the fact that you are so candid about this and, like, and no. just like, like, you know, and thank you for being, th thank you for your, 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 for being raw and candid, like seriously, because people, people need to have these conversations and need to realize that it's nothing to be embarrassed about be, being raped and, and, you know, um, it's nothing to be um, ashamed about. Um, and even for me, my situation, you know, I picked up, I was cruising Crenshaw, you know, looking for some trade, knowing I should have been going to my boyfriend's house or whatever, but I didn't deserve, I didn't deserve what happened to me, you know, and no. that child that he did that to didn't deserve that. No one deserves to be raped. No one deserves to be violated. And some people, you know, sometimes feel like, well, what were you wearing? Yeah. You know, you, know you, you shouldn't have been smoking or drinking with him. Yeah. People will then make it seem as if you brought it up on yourself. And that, that, that further, that's further, that, that does further harm to a person.
Yeah, a hundred percent. And like I said, no one has a right to be violated. I don't care what I wear. I don't care what I do. You know, and I preach this a lot to men. And I often say all the time, because I feel like I hate the judgment that I feel like men place on women particularly, right? Like we see like young, young girls who may be hypersexual or overly sexual. And then we want to nail them to the cross and crucify them. Look at that hoe, call them all kinds of crazy names. And I don't believe in that. I don't believe in that because that very woman that you're calling the hoe, if you, if you really sit down and have maybe a conversation with her, I'm sure you'll be, she'll be able to trace back to the man who um, somehow so subconsciously told her that she wasn't valuable at some point. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I hate to say it and it's true, but I've been doing this now, this job for a long time, dealing with, with the community and dealing with victims of sexual assault, domestic violence. I work in this arena every day. It's become my passion. Uh -huh. And every single woman I've run across, I've, I've been able to link their pain to a man who um, assaulted them, whether it was a father, a brother, a cousin, a neighbor. And not that, we, not, that, not that we're, you know, bashing men or whatever. No, but... no, no, I love men. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I tell people that I, I love me a man. Well, no, but what I'm saying is, Huh? Yes, yeah, but, but the, we should talk about a society issue. This is a society issue, it and is. it's a society, and, and it, always it's, it's, and it's another pandemic. Oh, it is yeah, a whole another thing, and, and I, so I tell my men friends all the time. I said it's not to you guys start holding your homeboys accountable. Yeah, you you know what I mean. Your brothers, your uncles, you accountable for their behavior. Um, because men have a camaraderie that women don't typically have with one another, right? Oh, I know so. You. Yeah. So until we start holding even them, even though I'm not, even though, even though I'm not one of, I'm one of the boys, but I'm not one of the boys. Yeah, I yeah. I know how they are. Yeah, you know how they are. Yeah. So you have, you heard conversations, and I mean, at this point, I think everybody knows how they are. Whether you a man or at this, at this age, we've all kind of experienced it somewhere down the line. You know how the niggas are. We do. We know how all of them are. Okay. It's funny because if you come to my class on Tuesday. The majority of my class of my life so i get you know it's like they cycle in because after a year i get new you know new batches of women and uh -huh. you walk in there and the majority of them are all part of lgbtq community these bitches is bad like they'll whip your ass even like for real and i love them i love my girls and um wait, wait, you know you talking about, like, you talking about trans um well i don't know i never asked them if they've like gone through it or not but uh -oh. You know, you look at them and you would identify man, not woman, with a lot of the women that are in my class on Tuesdays. They're they lean more towards trans men. Yes, they they dress like men. They look like you know, men. and it's interesting because I know sometimes, um, you know, a lot of women who have been raped or assaulted by men. You know, sometimes I know that they'll do things to start. You know, they'll hide their body, they'll hide their yeah. shapes, they won't wear makeup or. They'll do things so that they're no longer attractive. Attractive. So, you know, they were telling me they, they have me dying. They're like, these niggas still be trying to get with me and look at me. Like, I don't even look like a girl. And, and they I'm still like, want it. And they still want they it. They still want it. That's what I'm saying. So that's what I mean. The society, where are the boundaries? Where's the respect for women just in general? Whether you're a woman that looks like a woman, whether you're a woman who chooses not to look, whatever. Bottom line is, where is the boundaries? Mm -hmm. There are zero as it pertains to us when it comes down to men. And that's the part that I want to change. Um, I became a certified domestic violence counselor in which I received my certification and training through accredited project Peacemakers at 77th District Police Station in LA. And I'm also co-founder of Shepherd's Door Domestic Violence Resource Center alongside my mother, Linda O'Frey, who was founder. Tell us about, you know, when it started, how you got involved, what's the mission, the backstory? Yeah, so Shepherd's Door was created by my mother mm -hmm. and I was her inspiration because of what I experienced. Um, like I said, I come from a very conservative family. No one in my family has had, not that I'm aware of my experiences. They're all married, still with their husbands. You know, I'm, I'm the only one who kind of started a different path, right? And I think my mother, I did. You're the only hot girl. You're the only hot girl. My girl, I did it different. Yeah. And so my mother, I think, didn't really know how to help me. And I was very resistant to her help for a while because that's where the anger come from. And so instead she started helping other people, right? I think that's how she healed. And I was not a part of it for a long time because I hid. I did not like to talk about what I experienced because I hadn't had the tools to process that pain. So I stuffed it. 
So that my mom was just out here and she just realized that I wasn't the only one. And it was so many other girls, so many other women who's had these experiences. So her being little Miss Mother Teresa, that's what I call her. She just started helping people. And at some point, my dad was like, Linda, you can't keep taking all of our money. <laughs> you got to we got to do this the right way. So he helped her form the nonprofit along with some other mentors who helped her. And the funny thing is after, like I said, I moved here to, to Pat to I'm um, back to Pasadena, mm -hmm. having come out of again, another abusive relationship with my youngest child's father mm -hmm. um, and opening my office prestige insurance in the same building where Shepherd Storm was, it's kind of like brought God brought me here to this place that my mother established for me to heal. And that's when I started to learn that it wasn't just me. So all this time through life in my bubble, I hadn't known anyone who had my experiences. So I thought it was just me. And then being right here, I got to see the women that were coming in. I started to get to hear some stories. So I just kind of started joining in in the conversations and sitting in on support groups myself. And I actually felt like I belonged somewhere I, I felt like no one was judging me um i started to learn that i didn't have nothing to be ashamed of because all these women in here we all were different ages different colors different walks of life um some were from lgbtq some were very old older women in their 60s i mean it was everything you can think of in these support groups and that's when i understood that it was bigger than just me and that's when i got the courage to start talking about it I started talking about it once amongst my peers in this group and um, I was in therapy and I remember my mom came to me and she was like, Tanisha, I think you'll be great because um, we need another facilitator for women. We're going to start dealing with women and I think you'll, you'll be great. And mind you, at this point, I, I, I mean, I went through hell with the youngest woman's father. That was the most physical abuse I've ever encountered. And so I was in heavy therapy along with my kids because we were overly traumatized and, um, I talked to my therapist. She says, I think you'll be good for your healing. And I was like, what? Like, you want me to talk out loud to people? Like, I can't talk out loud to people. You know, because people are going to be like, how are you going to go through that? Your mama started this organization. You already been raped before. I mean, like, it just sounded crazy to me. And she says, I think it'll be good. And I started to do it. And honestly, that's where my healing truly began. And I have not shut up since. I share my story loud and proud. And I don't share it because um, it makes me feel good, to be honest, because I get triggered every time I share it. feel it in my body. I feel it. But I share it because I feel like if my experience changes one person's life and gives somebody the strength to be brave, um, then I didn't go through it for no reason. Mm -hmm. So I have to share it. And I'm not even going to cry. Like, I have to because I can't keep carrying it and feel like it doesn't have purpose. You understand? Mm -hmm. Like, so I have to do it. Mm -hmm. And it has nothing to do with, I want recognition or um, I want people to praise me for it, but it has everything to do with, it's the only way that I can live with it. You have to, you have to talk, you have to. I have to. It's like, I don't want to say forced to, but it's like, you have to share it. Yeah. And I, I I totally understand. And no, it's not for praise or recognition or recognition or no, it's it's you 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 have to share what you lived through, your experience. Yeah. And I tell people a lot of times, you know, sometimes your pain is your purpose. And that's what I feel like. I feel like my pain it brought me to my purpose. And this is what I'm on this earth to do. Um, I've met so many beautiful people like in this journey and I feel like I get more from them than they get from me. It's like a reciprocal mm -hmm. um, relationship, you know, mm -hmm. like them being vulnerable with me and, and opening up and telling me things that they never got to tell anybody else and, and feeling safe enough to do it is like honor for me, mm -hmm. you know, um, people trusting me. It's like it, I feel honored that they do. Mm -hmm. So this is like my life mission and I have to do it. And I tell people that all the time. And you can't, I, I, I can't walk away from it. I just can't. You know, over throughout my life, I've had people um, share so many things with me. And now that I've gotten older and, you know, there is so much trauma in the world and people being, I, I, I kind of, I have to 
what's the word called? Uh, I have to create more boundaries because mm -hmm. I can't, um, and it's a part of my self-care, you know, taking care of myself. I can't, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a therapist. I'm not a, not a, not a, um, I mean, I can offer emotional support and I can listen and I can care and I can sympathize and I can empathize, but, you know, I'm not a licensed therapist, but yeah. even then, you know, listening to other people and hearing things, you know, it triggers me too. I just, I just have more boundaries now and I'm yes. more mindful of what I'm about to, you know, take in. And it's interesting because I, you know, became a writer and I was always, I mean, I used to, you know, share my story, talk about it too, but then I started writing and sharing it and stuff. And, you know, I wasn't even thinking, not so much that because it, it became normal to me because it's not normal what I experienced, but I wasn't thinking how this was going to trigger other people. I like, like, like had no conscious, you know, that, 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 that yeah. you know, this is not, this is, this is not something like, wasn't thinking of how this person was going to feel after they read this or, you know, even just ha had no idea, you know, and, yeah. and I'm more mindful of that too. And I realize now, like, you know, the average person is not having, uh, definitely the experience that I had and the average person, they're not, they're not having the experience that you had and that people, you know, who've been through traumatic situations, they're not, they're not experiencing that. And um, I say to myself, how can people be so cruel in this world if they haven't yeah. been raped? If they haven't had a loaded gun, you know, rammed into their mouth, how can they be so cruel and mean to people? And like, yeah. what's what's what what you mad about? Like, just why are you mad? Yeah. <laughs> like sometimes, it. sometimes I'm like, I'm like, like, do they really have reasons to be that mad and fucked up? No. You know, but they, I mean, well, but you know, they'll give you a reason. They got well in yeah. their mind, they have reasons and stuff. But it's just one of those things where I just, I just, you know, I keep boundaries now, and I'm more mindful of. You know, it does. It is triggering to to people. And, um, well, I just want to expound on that. What you just said is so true because it's funny. I did a, a podcast about boundaries, and I talk a lot about that because people are like, "How do you do this work?" And, and I, so I did have to understand like that I have to create boundaries, and and, and balance is really important because um, doing this work and when people know you can help them, then all of a sudden they start telling everybody, "No, you can help them." Right? Go to Miss Anisha, Miss Anisha. You know, and it's like, okay, at some point. Like I'm a human, I have kids, I have a life, I have a business. I like to do other things besides sit here and listen to your experience. Not that I don't care, but like, that's not my whole entire not life. Not today, not today, sweetie. Oh, I will do that. Like, you know what? Like, come holler at me on Tuesday. Like, you know. But sometimes, I, it's, but some, sometimes it's time to twerk. Oh, I'm just saying. Sometimes and it's time it, to do hair and makeup. And, yes, yeah. yes. Like I can't, I can't, you know, I can't all day. And so I've learned that really quick doing this work, like, cause there's a lot of her people and all of a sudden the word get out and everybody start coming. You're like, are, oh, hell no. There are. Like, there are. Not be here all day. And I say that a lot to people. I'm not a therapist. Yes. Although I do highly recommend that you, you go get one. You mm -hmm. know, I love therapy. I still go, but you know, that's not, that's not what I am, but I am a safe space for you right. to help you get to that point where you feel safe enough to go talk to someone mm -hmm. who can really help you and give you the tools that you really, really need. Some people don't have the words or some people can't, from what I hear, you know, I, I know some people, they, they can't, they can't express after certain things have happened to them. They don't have the words to express, you know, what have happened. I mean, it, yeah. it, it, it manifests, it affects certain, you know, trauma affects people differently, you know. It does. It does. It, it, and it, that's it, why I don't judge for that reason. I don't judge. I shut my mouth. I don't judge. I love, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Period. So. Yeah. That's just where I'm at. Now I don't love everybody. And some of y'all, some people deserve what the hell they get. You I say it again. Some of y'all getting me. exactly what you deserve. Yeah. Let me shut up and mind my business. But <laughs> but at the same time, you know, I'm not quick, quick to judge. Yeah. Shepherd's Door Domestic Violence Resource Center is a nonprofit established in March 2000 to assist and support victims of domestic violence and prevent the cycle of domestic violence through youth education, public awareness, and collaboration with community partners. Our belief is everybody deserves to live in a safe environment free of abuse and violence. Um, you use your training, your life experiences as a survivor of domestic violence and teen dating violence. You mentioned it earlier, the 52-week court-mandated domestic violence classes through LA County Probation Department. Yes. Mm -hmm. I do that. And also um, healthy versus unhealthy relationship education in the schools. Because you know what, Nishan, if someone would have walked in our class and talked to us about what to look out for, right? Ooh, um, girl. What, 
What if they would have told me not to be cruising Chris off of some train, I, I would have never went cruising Chris <laughs> off of some train, especially near Lamar Park. Nobody told me. Yes. Nobody tells you. So like if someone would have just told me because we take for granted, we think everyone's going to get these things at home. And it's like, no, my mother and father have been together 40 some years. My mom has only ever been with my dad. My parents cannot have prepared me for what I was going to experience. They didn't even know. So no, we got to prepare our young people. And, and, and that's why that part is like so important for me. I love talking to the young people. Like I, that's like one of my most favorite things to do. Boys and girls, The third, um, one of us has a fear or risk of change or change. So basically goes kind of goes back to what I said, do not try and change you. Um, again, if there's something that's not working, you should feel comfortable enough to say it and it should be respected. We are not each other, we are, we're not each other growing as individuals. So that kind of goes back to change again. So if you and I are together, Let's just say, I'm just saying, 2018. Okay. <laughs> so you and I are together, and I feel like since we got together, I'm not growing, or you feel like you're not growing. You feel like you're not really able to pursue your dreams. When you talk about what you want to do after high school, you know, I, well, you shouldn't do that. You should just stay here in Pasadena. Like, why do you want to go to school out of state? You know, like, I'm, I'm holding you down. I'm making it hard for you to, to want to see bigger and want more from your life. That's not a healthy relationship. The person that you make her working with young people in conflict resolution. What was the most, what, what, would, what would you say has been the most surprising thing that you've learned from them? That girls are more aggressive. Than I'm, not, I'm 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 not, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not, I'm, I mean, I'm saying I'm not, yeah, I'm not surprised. I'm not no. surprised. Well, you, well, yeah. And that's one reason why that boy didn't get convicted that night because they were trying to say that I was the aggressor. They tried to mm. say that they tried to say that the handcuffs and the gun were mine, mm. and, that I was, and that I was into F and M sex. Wow! So they tried to make it a sexual thing that you was that you want to do some kinky. Got it. Yeah. I, and I was just I was in that. You, even if I was, do I have the right to get shot for it? I'm just saying. Right. Even if I was, I was just oh oh, and then and then you know family and friends and over the years has taken on. You know, oh, you was dressed up. He thought you was a girl. I wasn't dressed up. I was yeah. just like, you know, how, you know, you know. Yeah. And, and um, so, no, I do know that girls can be aggressive. Because I've had girls, I've had girls get aggressive with me. Yeah, girls are very aggressive. Yeah. And you I, weren't I, aggressive. You were sweet. No, I was very, no, I was very, very, very passive, overly passive. But guess what? I got aggressive after that. I became very aggressive. Well, Hell you know, yeah. I mean, but, but, you, but, you know, to be honest, um, Sometimes, well, sometimes you learn that you have to be aggressive. Had I not been aggressive that night, yeah, I wouldn't be here. Yeah, hundred percent. And when I was young, I remember my brother would always tell me, you know, just because you're gay, you know, don't don't let nobody, you know, beat on you. You know, you're gonna have to fight. And my brother was always telling me, you know, you got to fight, you got to fight. Did it? I just be like, yeah. you know, I, I was the furthest thing from my mind. Yeah. Well, all yeah. of that, all of that that he was telling me for for the the, the for for you know, almost what 15, 16 years, you know. I ended up having to, and yeah. you know, you, you you're sometimes you be in situations or whatever, and you don't realize, you know, that adrenaline kick in or you know whatever. Um, so yeah. aggra aggressive. I mean, of course, there's different types of aggression. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yes. And I mean, it, it is it's, it all serves its purpose at its at a, at its appropriate time. Yes. What I yes. like to teach with the the young people. Um, so we don't really call it domestic violence. We teach it in classes. We call it healthy versus unhealthy relationship, right? Mm -hmm. So I talk a lot about um, communication. You know, I talk a lot about control because that's where it kind of stem out with them. Yeah, like, you know, these girls are like, but I don't be wanting him to go out. And what if I call him 15 times and he don't answer his phone and then I'm popping up over his house. I'm going to pull up and it's like, okay, hold on, honey. Like, nobody has to answer the phone. Like, that's the how it works. I mean, you, you have to... You have to respect people's space and boundaries. If someone's not answering the phone, maybe that means either one, they're not available, or two, they don't want to talk to you. So you pulling up at their house, what message is that going to send? You're going to make them talk to you? So then that's where we're having the conflict there, right? You can't make somebody who are their own human being do what you want them to do. That's not how it works in life. So it's us 
understanding these things and it's us explaining these things. And it's also giving people the knowledge and young people to know the difference between someone who may possibly um, have bad motives as it pertains to being with you and somebody who uh, who doesn't, right? Because if someone would have came into our school, I can promise you, I wouldn't have went on that date with, with the person who raped me and now it's my baby dad. I would have done it. I w All the signs were there, Nisha. I just didn't know that they existed. What we talk about is unhealthy. As people, we're always growing and we're changing. You guys are not who you're going to be next year at this time. And you're not who you're going to be when you turn 20. You're always going to change and grow. And so you want to be around people, family, relationships. No. And it's, it's interesting that you say that because that night, um, when we went to the home to get the weed that we were smoking, um, you know, I had, he got out the car and I couldn't see where he went. Mm. And well, I couldn't, I, I knew which direction he went, but I couldn't see what building. And mm -hmm. then I, something told me to turn my car around just to, you know, reposition my car. You know, I could have left at that point. Yeah. We went to a, a 7-Eleven after that. And that's where he got his 40 ounces malt mm -hmm. liquor mm -hmm. in the car, you know, got out the car. I could have left at that point. Now, you know, my mind went back. And at that point, you yeah. know, never heard any clinking because he had on a sweater in mm -hmm. his hood. He had a, he didn't have a hood on. It was the summer. He had changed his T-shirt and put on a, a sweater, but it had a hood. It was a hooded sweater because I could see the hood. Yeah. But when he got in the car and out of the car, I never heard any clinking. I never heard the handcuffs and the gun. But, you know, so at the liquor store at 7-Eleven, I could have, you know, uh, drove off. When we got to the park, you know, we were sitting there at one point, he got out of the car. I think he peed or something or whatever. That was another, I could have left. So I had, I had three different opportunities. And then when I was finally ready, I had started the car up and then, you know, he was like, you know, what's, what's going on and stuff. And I was like, you know, I gotta, I was like, I actually gotta go. My boyfriend was yeah. paging me, my boyfriend, you know, pay, ah. yeah, pagers back then. Girl, I, what is that called? Your instincts? Our instincts? Yeah, your intuition tells you. Your yeah. intuition, your intuition. It's interesting because. You know, yeah, you go from high school and then you're just out there, you know, you're navigating your way, dating, meeting people, you know, and you said you were pretty, to some degree, you would say you were pretty much sheltered because of your church. Your, Very naive, yeah. I was brought up as a Jehovah's Witness. And, yeah. you know, just one of those things where never, you know, could have imagined or seen myself in a situation, you know, yeah. something like that playing out the way it did. Um, yeah someone taking advantage of my na naivety, naivety. Yep. Yeah, a hundred And innocence. Yeah, a thousand percent. And it's crazy because the particular, my baby daddy, he chased after me for, since 10th grade, no, ninth grade. And I did not like him. He, he was relentless and would not let up on me. He was a relentless for wanting to date me. And he was classified as a quote unquote bad boy. And I remember the woman in the front office told me, why are you dating him? Mm -hmm. You're too good for him. I remember, and I mean, me and her are still cool to this day because she's so proud of me and she goes to a lot of stuff that I do. And even that principal, I got to give you a story about that principal who looked down on me in a minute. But Ms. yeah, Newman. she said, you were Miss Newman. Hey, Miss he, Newman. Like, hey. Girl, the shade, the shade of it all. Like, You're too good for him, you know? And so finally I gave in and I was like, okay, you know, I can't believe he really likes me. I guess he really likes me and my stupid, naive little self allowed him to take me out. And that was, I was thinking to myself, I should have stuck to my, something was saying, mm. don't date him. It kept saying, don't, 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 don't date him. Yeah. I remember very clearly wow. and I just ignored. And then he already had a reputation as a bad boy. It was mm. said, and I just ignored all those things and mm. look back and all the signs were there. A thousand percent there. And this person, that is the person who is your child's father? How did that, I've, I've never asked anyone this question. You don't have to answer it. How does that, how does that play into having a child, you know, and having that, having that, ha, what happened happened, but then having the child with that person, that is a constant, is that, isn't that even more so of a constant reminder? No. So it's like crazy how psychologically I, dealt with all of it, right? So this is the thing, like, so after I got pregnant, I was super traumatized. He was nowhere around when I had my son, but he came back after. So after homecoming, after I graduated, because mm -hmm. I graduated, I think I was still 17. He came back. Um, and by then my self-esteem was shot to hell, right? Because no one really said, 
this shouldn't have happened to you. Like everybody kind of swept it under the rug. Everybody knew what happened. Duh, got a baby from it. I was traumatized afterwards, but it was never spoken about. So, and then remember I was heavy in the church and in my church, when I got pregnant, they were telling me I could no longer be a part of the church, pretty much. I couldn't sing the choir anymore. I was really shocked. Honey. Yeah, and that's why I have issues with church. Bye, Tanisha. That, pretty much. And that's why I got an issue with the church. All of a sudden, y'all taught me that God loves me. Mm -hmm. But now I got violated. Something that I didn't want happened to me. And now you're saying that God doesn't love me anymore. So I went through a lot of psychological issues mm -hmm. that led me back to him. I damn near begged men to take me back because I said God wasn't going to love me. You know, true story. You, so you, you that all of that made you want to go back to him? Yeah, because he told he used to say no one's gonna want you no more. You had a baby. The church told me pretty much God doesn't love me anymore. True story. Um, my I felt like my family nobody was really talking about it. I I felt unworthy. I felt like if people were looking down on me. I felt like nobody was gonna want me. I really did. That's how I really felt. And I felt like he was the only person that was gonna want me because he did it to me. Does that make sense? That that's how I felt. So I can understand. I, I went back to him and it was the worst time of my life and that's when I got pregnant with my other child and that's when the physical abuse I went back to him and he definitely physically and sexually assaulted me throughout the year of that relationship really bad um and now I look back and I see the mental illness I see now there was definitely mental illness there like he will go to sleep and then wake up and be a whole nother person um yeah he it, it was really bad and I left, mm -hmm. I did, I left because I was afraid that he was gonna hurt my second baby, which was a girl. He's like, he hated her. I don't know what it was. Um, so I left and I never looked back. And I remember when I left, I was a hot mess. You talking about, so I was worse than I was when I got raped coming back because I had endured even more stuff. And I don't know, Nishan, something in my mind kept saying that this isn't right. Like, this is not, God, if you say you are who you are, I refuse to believe this is what you want from me. I just, I couldn't, I was conflicted between, is this what I'm supposed to do? And this not feeling right. You know what I mean? Well, like, pick up. So were there any memorable people that stood out in your mind um, from, you know, working with the young people over the years? You mean in the schools? The programs? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, for sure. Yes, lots of them. And I'm, I'm still pretty much in contact with everyone. I mean, just about everyone who crossed my path, when you're in each other's lives under those circumstances, you almost become like family. Mm -hmm. So most of them all are still very much right. They follow me on social media or, mm -hmm. you know, we are in contact from time to time. But yes, very much so. I call them all my little, my little loves. Like I love them all. I do. Are, boy, are boys more receptive to discussing anger issues with men or women? And what about girls? Or do you think, I mean, I, I, I would think that boys would be more comfortable, you know, discussing anger issues with men. No, honestly, you know what I've learned? I learned under the right circumstance that we create the right environment, you can get people to talk about anything, to be honest. So I've never, I don't have a one or the other, like pretty much anyone in my, that I bring into my environment, I could get them to open up to me very easily. Um, <clears throat> because I create the atmosphere and the space for them to feel safe enough to do so. So I don't really think it's a gender thing. I really think it's a it's an energy thing, right? People are vulnerable where they feel safe in a story case close and where they feel like they're not going to be judged. I have sat around some straight up assholes, straight up and down assholes, both men and women, and have broken down their walls and gotten them to open up straight up. I know it's amazing. I broke it down, like bust them open, like you gonna keep a real gang members they don't shot and kill people you know um oh one of my favorites they all got feelings they all do one of my favorites you will see her and i think even a man would be scared of her ass like she was so she was kicked out of other programs <laughs> and they asked and they sent her to my program and you see me right <clears throat> so i'm very overly fem feminine i'm little and i'm a little person i'm only five two 125 pounds <laughs> And I, I felt intimidated at first when I, because you get like a, their, you know, their sheet, you kind of get their scholarly AP, all the background of this person. And I'm reading and I'm like, whoo, okay. This woman is like angry. Um, but she's, you know, a trans woman, but she's very angry. And I'm like, okay, how is she going to receive me? 
So I had to really just like Tanisha, you have to, and I call my, I think it's a gift. Like I'm a bridge. I could connect with people. I say, you have to find a way to connect with this person so that you can create a place where this person can be themselves and then trust you with the most vulnerable part of their heart, because that's where they're hurting. And that's where the anger is coming from. And I was able to build that with her. And um, we're still really good friends. They actually she calls me all the time and be like, man, I be hearing your voice in my head. Like Miss Tanisha said, X, Y, Z, whoop, de whoop. So I knocked that nigga and I'll out. And I'm like, yes, you're still free. I'm happy, you know? But we became very, very close. And, you know, she brought her, her wife to my class and her wife thanked me like, you changed our whole entire marriage. If it wasn't for you, like we would not still be together. So like, I'm proud of, of that part. So I don't think it's a guy or girl or nothing. I just think it's the environment that you create. One of my things was, you know, I wanted to know why that person did what they did to me, why, why Ricky did what he did. What was he gonna do if he was able to do what he wanted to do? And yeah. so, you know, when I wrote him again in 2013, you know, I used a much sweeter, sensitive approach. I used a much more feminine approach yeah and some of the things he was telling me you know and he was telling me how he used to use the handcuffs on his girlfriend his, well he said it was his girlfriend and he got really you know it started turning into just very you know sexual very sexualized never said you know that he was gonna hurt me or you know do anything to, to you know you know to, yeah. he said he he, he 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 said he wasn't he said he wasn't sure you know um yeah. but then he said you know he had got into a shootout sometime prior and start thinking about that once, you know, we start fighting with the gun and, you know, he, wow. it's, but I was able to make him comfortable enough to, I, what I did worked second time around. I yeah. got him to trust me. I got him to look at me as a person and, yeah. you know, he understood how what he did affected me um, and how it made me feel as a person. And, you know, I really, I really did. I needed to, I, I needed, I needed some, I needed to understand what could drive a person to do something like that to just, you know, a random person and, um, you know, the context of his, his background, his upbringing, you know, what his family was like and everything. Um, and I, I can say I got what I wanted in that sense. You know, I realized, I remember when, you know, going through therapy made me understand like, like I had to heal, right? And my issue was I didn't know how to get to healing without ever getting closure from the men. Because at this point in my life, it was not just one man. It had now become three men, right? Who have all um, assaulted me. And by the third one, the pain was just unbearable. Like, I don't think I've ever wanted to die more than I did at this point in time in my life. Like, I, I just I found it hard to even live. I did have a full on nervous breakdown, like a legit real nervous breakdown. And I knew that it was coming. Like you almost know, you like, it's, it's coming. It's coming. I don't know, but it's coming because I can't keep going. And I talked to this man who I met on LinkedIn and he's in part of the DV world too. And he was actually a, a reformed perpetrator. He's played professional football and all this stuff. And I listened to one of his speeches and I found it fascinating because in my mind, I had always saw perpetrators as inhuman because to do some of the things that you do to people, how can you be a human being in my brain, right? So I disassociated them with people in my mind. And, and so when I spoke to him, he was kind enough to talk to me and I hadn't told him what I went through. I had just reached out to him on behalf of Shepherd Store and maybe thinking I could get him to come in and you know speak to our group or something of that nature. But I felt really comfortable because he did that same thing too. He created it a very comfortable space for me. And when I share with him a little bit about what I went through, he apologized to me. And he, that was the first time Nishan, I can honestly say as God is my witness, I have ever heard anyone apologize to me for what I went through. No one has never, ever, ever throughout the course of my life. And at this point in my life, I think I was 41. So this just happened a couple of years ago. Said, I'm sorry. And acknowledge that I should have never had the experiences that I had that I had. And the fact that it came from a man, I think that's what I needed to hear to open me up to be okay with healing. I broke down. I don't think I've ever cried like that before in my life. Like I sobbed. And I realized that, Tanisha, you're going to have to heal yourself without ever getting an acknowledgement of your pain. You're gonna have to do this. 
because you're never going to get the acknowledgement that you want from the people who you feel failed you and the people who you feel hurt you and the people you feel like did not um, support you. And that the realization of that almost hurt me just as bad as what I encountered. But it was a real reality that I had to make peace with because I realized like me getting better was for me. And if I don't do it, I don't know what, where I would be. I'm gonna be honest, if I didn't do it. You know what I mean? You can only shake a soda can up so long before it explodes. And my soda can was about to explode. That's how bad it was, you know? And yeah. I have to, I have to take time out. I have to take some 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 time, some time out. Um, I, I, I just, you know, I mean, I know how I am, but I know, you know, things that trigger me or make me uncomfortable or whatever. But, um, I mean, you know, I don't like, I mean, I don't ever go to men's houses and don't ever go to, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't go to men's houses. I don't, I don't, I don't, there, I mean, there's just a lot of things I don't do. Um, me too. That's they're not allowed to spend the nights at my house, you know. <laughs> Is that great? Huh? Is that crazy how we become the same way? People are like, how do you date? It's so crazy. Like to date me is very hard because I have so yeah. many. It's weird. To date me is very weird. That's why I don't have a husband. People are like, why are you not married? Because I'm fucking weird. Like, so I can't get married. Well, you, I you how do I say it? You, you know, even though you know you're with somebody and they haven't, you know, did anything to you or whatever, and it's not so much that you're reliving that trauma and stuff, it's hard to be completely vulnerable to the point where like. Like, you know, you were saying, you know, you have to be in control and stuff. That night, what happened to me specifically, you know, I learned, you know, to take control, but I also learned that, excuse me, I also learned that me taking control, you know, was a, was a good thing and a positive thing. And I definitely know how to take control, but it's hard to relinquish control. Okay. And especially, how- especially when certain tools have been brought into the situation, you know, That's that nice. can harm you. Um, and that can, that can, um, what is it, restrain you, you know, so for me, you know, I mean, you know, I'm just, I mean, I'm a very controlling person. I am <laughs> too. And, and, oh my I can't help it. But, and, and I wonder sometimes if, you know, that wouldn't have happened, if yeah. that would have affected me, you know, with being controlling. And I know I'm so controlling to the point where it's probably very off-putting to people and people may not understand that about my personality, but, you know. That's funny. That's fine. We're, we're very similar, though. I am the That's same one. That's fine because there's always a door. I'm just saying, and there's another one that'll come and be okay with this. So I don't and know. There's a window. <laughs> yeah. you know yeah. There's a window and there's a fire escape, too. I'm just saying, find your way out. Yeah, I'm it's a, not, it's not, I mean, I'm not, I, I don't, to be honest, I'm going to be, I don't ever really feel like I'm missing out on anything. Me too. So people go, like, do you want to be married? And I said, marrying me will look like this is sad. He would have to live over there. I would have to live over here. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You'll never get a key over there. I don't really want a key over there. And then we see each other sometimes and you got to go away. I need my space. Like I have issues. Like I need my space, but sometimes I want to be together. But most of the time I want to be apart. Um, I- I'm afraid to fully put my all in with one person for so many reasons. Out of fear you'll switch on me. Mm-hmm. Out of fear you'll abandon me. Mm-hmm. Out of fear you'll hurt me. So I have to have my own space. I don't care. So marry me will look really weird. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that is, that, and that's how you that and, and that's just your I mean that's how you that's how you have to move through life for you to be safe and feel safe and for you to for you to function and that's just that for me and I don't really know how to turn that part off and I don't know if I really want to and mm-hmm. I've kind of made peace with that I used to get sad like dang I want to be like those women who are like just believe in love and the fairy tale, but you know that Nita Baker song, Fairy Tales? Have you ever listened to it? Listen to it. Listen to well, the words. Well, you know, I will now because I'm going to play it while we, you know. Yeah. You got to listen to the words fairy tales. Because okay. when I heard that song, I said, that's my life. You know, I was, I was, like I said, the family dynamic you saw I grew up in, that's all I saw was, you know, everybody married. And my uncles are nice to the wife. My daddy treats my mother like a princess. He's always treated me like a princess. I've just never had saw negative interactions with men and women within my family dynamic. So I had a fairy tale mm. mindset of what relationships look like. And then I met the big bad wolf. And that's pretty much what that song was about. And so it was a reality check that I can't seem to get out of. And I can't disconnect that reality with this reality. You know what I mean? So so my reality looks different. Than most people's, and I've found 
a level of um of acceptance with that but it still makes me sad sometimes because i'm like oh i want to be one of those women who just feel like oh my god the fairy tale and my husband my husband but i don't think that's who i am and i feel like i already have my kids you know so I, it's not like i want to get married to have a family i have my family already so to me i don't really feel that it's not a necessity for me anymore or I, or ever to be honest i don't know if i ever want to be somebody's wife you said what i don't know if i ever want to be somebody's wife <laughs> it's just the truth mm -hmm. so, um no. so when i invited you on the show i told you that i was going to dedicate your interview to my two great grandmothers from texas zephyr smith scott and beatrice shiloh anderson both of them were victims of domestic violence and gun violence in 1923 and 1934 Obviously, I never met them. This was 100 years ago. But the story of my grandmother, Zephyr Scott, being shot seven times by her husband, you know, always stayed with me. This was my mom's father's mom. And we have a picture of her, a black and white photo of her. You know, she was trying to divorce my great grandfather. This was in East Texas, Marshall, Texas. And he, um, and then there was my mom, her second husband. This is my stepdad. He was abusive, the one we lived up in the meadows with. Mm. And then we had moved to Oklahoma with him for a while briefly. And then that didn't last long because that's when he got, that's when, I guess that's when he got more abusive, or I guess that's when I started to see it. Mm -hmm. And that's when we ended up moving back to Pasadena and we ended up living behind Rodney King's mom, Odessa King. Um, mm -hmm. That was in, that was in 1991. How do you feel about women being prosecuted for killing their abusive partners and self-defense? Should they be prosecuted? No. And to be honest, the majority of the system of women that are in prison are because of domestic violence, um, defending themselves. Mm -hmm. And I don't think women should be prosecuted for defending themselves. But again, it goes back to this rooted, nasty um, history that America has as it pertains to men and women. Women were always seen as property of their husbands. That's why their last names were changed, right? So that they can identify who you belonged to. So this system that we see was created way back then based off of that, that premise and those rules. So a woman didn't have the right to say no. When a woman didn't have the right to protect herself against her husband because the husband owns the woman and that's still very much how the system sees it. So the fact that you get prosecuted for self-defense because that's what that is, is wrong. And it should be no different than a woman protecting herself from a stranger walking down the street as her protecting herself from her husband. Um, I get a lot of women, all ages, all ethnicities, all financial backgrounds, um, who have unjustly faced the legal system because they protected themselves. Yeah, so no, I don't believe that's fair. And I believe that women should have the right to protect themselves um, in any situation, even if it is with your quote unquote husband. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that is true. And so um, when I told you uh, you were thanking me for being the person who I am and for being being your um, prom, your not prom, your homecoming, your home, home, homecoming day, you had also said, because I, I had told you that the story, I, sorry, I told you that I was going to, I told you about my two great grandmothers and I was going to dedicate this to them, blah, blah, blah. And you had said, so sorry to hear this. It saddens my heart every time I hear stories of victims who lost their lives due to domestic violence. I think we should talk about overcoming trauma and how healing and pain can draw you to your purpose. We both have overcome experiences that should have broken us, but instead it made us purposeful and stronger. I think the listeners will be inspired by our dialogue. I agree, a thousand percent. And a lot of what we talked about was just that. I mean, I think we have remarkable stories and it's so crazy how we met. You didn't know what my experience was. And then we parted ways and then you, also had your experiences and then we come back together and we can share those experiences. And this is what we do it for. Um, not, we get no pleasure <laughs> sharing our experiences and going back down memory lane, but it brings light to um, conversations that need to be had. Well, I and just thought, I, I just thought, you know, I was gonna interview you and talk about Pasadena and, you know, <laughs> some of the boys you might've had crushes on and the boys I had crushes on and, you know, how people fared in life and where people at and, you know, the ones that's a hot mess and the ones that's in jail and, you know, the ones that's disappeared. I had no idea that the conversation was going to end up focusing on, you know, things that happened to us personally affected us, you know, being victims of violence and um, community violence and, and mental health. I had no idea. But, you know, once I realized it, I was like, it's, you know, it's perfect. So, yeah. 
it was it was meant to happen and it's crazy how i never thought i'd see you again but then you come back into my life around this time of my life because there was a part of my life that i wanted to forget i blocked out to be honest my high school i blocked out everything that was associated with that part of my life especially when i left pasadena mm -hmm. coming into pasadena was um triggering i didn't realize it all these years that's why i didn't never like to come here when I would come visit my parents, I would be here for a cool one hour and back on the freeway and I'm out. I didn't drive around. I didn't move around because I didn't realize moving around this city made me feel um, was triggering for me because I didn't know what triggering was. You know what I mean? So we just naturally gravitate from things that don't make us feel good. And being here in this city for years did not make me feel good. But the mm -hmm. fact that I came back here running from something else and then I healed here and then you resurfaced in my life where I thought I'd never see you again. Like I have a different appreciation for mm. you. And, and I realized that you did me more to me than I may have realized in that moment because you gave me the opportunity to be able to have an experience that I would have walked away from had it not been you. I was willing to not be on that homecoming court if I couldn't be with somebody and I felt safe with them. I was willing to not do it. And it was fine with me, you know? So it well, had, we had to a be- great, I, From what I remember, we had a great time. We, we had, had a good time. I did. I loved you. I was like, oh my God, I had, yeah, I had fun. And I knew, and I was able to feel okay. Like I didn't have to worry and watch my back and think something strange was gonna happen. Like that means a lot for someone who's had I'm happy, that experience. And I'm, I'm happy to know that, you know, you, I'm happy to know that you felt safe with me. I'm, 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 I'm I mean, you know, I'm not used to girls telling me that. Um, <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not used to, you know, but, uh, yeah, when you told me that, I was like, I, I just, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have never, I would have never even thought that. And people need to know, people need to know, people need to know how they impacted people's lives. And, you know, that's why I asked you too, was that something that you had shared publicly, you know, regarding the the situation? Um, because I wasn't sure. Yeah. I, I, I didn't know. I had never heard that. Nobody knew. Um, I didn't start sharing it, like I said, until about now like five years ago now oh, okay you so know, still I rather never, okay yeah still rather new um mm -hmm. no i didn't share it because it was something that we just i guess that should not to talk about yeah i didn't and i mean honestly for the talking about it during that time would have probably done me honestly i look back more harm than good because mm -hmm. there was never going to be any consequences um for for what happened and i i accept that now mm -hmm. i don't think it's right but it's just something that I accept. But like you said, good old fashioned karma. Yeah. I found, listen, payback's a bitch. And for what I hear, it's been getting him ever since. There's been no good in his life. And it's funny because God always sends people along the way to remind me and tell me. And people don't even know what happened. Like, you know, I was just hear from some random person. And mm -hmm. it's like, oh my God, like, damn, this like, it's fucked up, you know? <laughs> so so no, no, that, like, that, look, that's good. That's good to hear. Yeah, it makes me feel good. I'm like, well, there, there, there you go. Oh, yeah, and speaking, so, speaking, and so with um, Ricky Marshall, Ricky Marshall, you know, he had his first parole hearing, was eligible for parole for the first time last January, and his parole was denied until 2027. So when I heard that, I was just like, yes, I was, you know, even though I'm 3,000 miles away, I was yeah. still like, yeah, he needs to sit there. He's not, he doesn't, yeah, he needs to sit yeah, there. Some for, people don't need to just be roaming around. Like, you know, no, no, he doesn't. I'm not sure. That. I'm not sure how I feel. I'm not sure if I want to take a trip to California, you know, I'm just, just exactly that part and meet him at the gate. Yeah, that part. <laughs> I don't know. I do have mental health issues. Oh, I have mental health issues at you know? this point in life. Who the right. hell don't? Exactly. Right, right, right. Who so who don't? Um, I went to Cal State LA with several other John Muir High students and some work in fields that don't require their college degrees. I dropped out to work in TV and film production, and I know that you attended the University of Phoenix. You majored in business administration? Yes, I did, but I did not finish. How long I were you there finish. for? Well, I should have been three years. <laughs> you were there for three years? Three oh, well, years. that's still, that's still a second. <laughs> Was that with the third one? The third one. <laughs> You, so are, you, did, you did say earlier that you fertile, right? I'm just saying, yeah. Oh, fertile, oh, fertile, mur oh, fertile, fertile myrtle. myrtle. Listen, fertile I would have a whole village if it all would have came into fruition. Yes. Ooh, so now no. I did not finish. And um, you know what? And I never needed to, though. I have 
created like a lot of success without my degree. My businesses are very successful. Um, you're answering, you're answering. Okay, so you're answering. I was going to ask you, in hindsight, as a successful entrepreneur, would you still yeah. have gone to college? No. Didn't need to. Didn't need to. No. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. Not at all. It's crazy because like I started my business in 2008. And um, my and first business, it was accounting and bookkeeping, my very first business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. After being fired several times. This <laughs> is like, prestige, yeah. prestige, right? No, it was Ofre Accounting and Bookkeeping Services. Oh, okay. That this was, was the first my one. Very mm -hmm. first business. Yeah. And I was a bookkeeper because my father's an accountant. So I kind of picked up his knack for numbers. Math was always my thing. And my first job was working at an account CPA firm. And then I was so good. They moved me to be a lead bookkeeper. Mm -hmm. And I was really great at that. And um, but the issue was when well, you have multiple kids, all different ages, everybody in different school, you can't work in corporate America. I don't care what nobody said. Like I had no help. I was a single mom. I was living in LA. There was nobody to pick up my kids, drop them off. One kid gets sick, everybody gets sick. One kid gets chick pocket, everybody got it. That was my life, you know? So balance was very hard for me. And um, I, I would get fired often <laughs> for missing so many days. It's just the truth. Oh, yeah, that's and understandable. The very last time I got fired, I couldn't seem to get a job quick enough because that's when the boom had happened in 2008. You remember when we had like the whole economic crash? Mm -hmm. That's the last time I got fired. And so I couldn't seem to find another job because I was always good with getting jobs pretty quickly in that field mm -hmm. and so then I ended up losing my house I lost my car <laughs> I lost everything and I had to move home even my boyfriend at the time and I had to move home with my parents that was the first time I ever moved back home here to Pasadena we were still living in Altadena at the time mm -hmm. and I was so depressed being here mm -hmm. um and I would just pray like I don't understand how like my life was going so well how did I, I just end up here you know mm -hmm. and I remember God speaking and saying, you know, focus on what makes you happy and all the things that I had created that brought me happiness. Cause you know, a lot about my past was very superficial, right? Like looking good made me happy. I um, being able to get my hair done, my nails done, being able to say my house is nice, being able to say I drive this car. That's where my happiness was because I found happiness and proving to everybody that, that I could be successful despite what I've gone through and without a man. That's what brought me happiness. So when all those things were taken from me, I didn't know where my happiness was. So I was hella depressed. Oh. So I started searching for it because I couldn't get those other material things back. Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized that I actually felt good being with my kids, like cooking them breakfast in the morning because I didn't have shit else to do, you know, take them to school and I didn't have nowhere else to go. So I would hang around, you know, and all of a sudden now I'm volunteering. All of a sudden now, you know, I'm seeing everything. And then I started paying like, we're happy and we ain't got shit. Like that's, that was real talk. Like we were really happy. So then I realized like, well, maybe this is what I need to focus on. And this is what I want. And then the question became, well, how are you going to do that? You know, girl, you know, you need to work. You ain't got no baby daddy. Ain't nobody giving you no check. You ain't got section eight. Like for real, how are you going to be like a full-time mom? For real, for real, for real, for real, for real, for real. And so I was like, okay. Um, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I didn't speak it to anybody because I thought it sounded stupid at that point. Because at that point back then, nobody was an entrepreneur if you go back in time, right? Like there was a no such thing. Like what we see now, be your boss, be a boss, be a boss. Yeah. Nobody was trying to be a boss back then. So I didn't have a savings account. I didn't even have a car. So how was I going to be a boss? I thought it sounded crazy as shit. Mm -hmm. And so I took this Tim job right here in Pasadena the Convention Center with this really happy, peppy white girl. Oh God, I remember she was... My God, Tanisha, you're working with me today. Today, you're going to be at the registration table at True Story. This is exactly how it was going down. You know, I had attitudes. My hair ain't done. My nails ain't done. Like, uh -huh. like I just want my check. You know, you're not, you weren't looking flawless. I was not looking flawless. In my mind, I thought I was not looking She's flawless, flawless, right? Flawless. Everybody, this is the time my hair ain't been done in two months. You know, Tanisha was not a happy person. And so, um, she had asked me as we were setting up, I know you're doing this, but what do you really want to do? It's something was like, tell her. And I'm like, I ain't gonna tell this one. Like, I ain't gonna tell her nothing. You know what I mean? And it was like, tell her. You know how you have those talks in your head? Yeah. And so then I just said it and I was like, yeah, I'm gonna start my own business. And she was like, oh my God, that's so great. What are you gonna do? And I was like, oh shit. Like, I don't have a plan, you know? And so I was like, oh, I'm gonna have an accounting and bookkeeping business. And as I said that, people started coming in. So I thought, whoo, 
All right, good. I ain't got to talk no more about it because Tanisha ain't got no damn plan. You know. You know, and I just I just want to say this before you go further. Um, the next question was going to be discuss your journey to be an entrepreneur. As much as we try to plan and hope for the best, sometimes things don't always work out the way we want them to. Have you been able to stick to your plan? And you're saying at this point you didn't have a plan. I didn't have a plan. No, I, I just knew that I enjoyed being my kid's mom. And for the first time, I really felt like a mother, right? Not just someone who was thrusted into having kids um, mm -hmm. under circumstances and just providing because that's what I'm supposed to do. But at this point in my life, I actually felt like their mom, you know, and I enjoyed that feeling. So this room filled up with people. I didn't know what I was there for, to be honest. And it come to find out it was a small business conference and oh. everybody in that room were small business owners. Mm -hmm. And this little white lady who didn't know me from Adam introduced herself, introduced me and said that she has a bookkeeping business for small businesses. And if you need her services, go to the back table. And to Sean, mm -hmm. I was shocked because I had a line of people and they all gave me their number. Mm -hmm. And I would say a good 12 of them became my clients. And just like that, I went from living in my parents' house with no car to buying a car and moving out four months later and never looked back. I haven't been on a job since. And I have been an, a successful entrepreneur mm -hmm. since that day. And I've been a full-time mother to my kids. And that's how I live my life. And that was in 2009? 2008. Yep, so 2009 is when I moved. Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. I lost my job in 2008. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes sometimes losing jobs and getting fired can be a big blessing. I'm just saying, you know, people are, oh, you're an entrepreneur. I'm like, yeah, because I had to figure it out because I, I can't keep getting fired in five seconds for having all these damn kids. So right. I had yeah. to figure out another journey. So I didn't want to do it because it was like, I just want to be a boss. Like, mm -hmm. you know, when your back is up against the wall, you got to get creative. And that mm -hmm. was just so put creative. Your back in, put your back into it. I had to put my back into put it. Put your back it. all up into it. You know, seriously. And thank you for watching Transgressions. You're watching part two of Tanisha O'Frey's interview for Women's History Month. Thank you.